over to colleagues from the DWP and also from Fulling, Fulfilling Lives Service Leader Engagement Team, who are going to talk about a long-term collaboration and how this has impacted positively on the workforce. Over to you. Hi everyone, just going to try and share my screen. Okay, is, is that coming up for everyone and can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. So my name's Vicky, I'm an engagement worker with Fulfilling Lives and I'm here with colleagues from the DWP um, and Fulfilling Lives as well. I'm not sure if everyone wants to introduce yourselves and say your, your job title. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Misha Harrison. I'm the DWP partnership manager for covering Brighton, Hove, Lewis, and New Haven. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm Astrid Holm. I was previously in the DWP district training department. I'm now a team leader in Brighton Job Centre. Uh, good morning. I'm Linda, and I'm a volunteer with uh, with Bill and Lives. I have been for a year in in Brighton. Thanks, everyone. So we're, we're here today so that we can talk about um, our partnership work, which we feel really demonstrates what can be achieved in terms of co-production and system change when both parties are really committed and interested in working together and making the change. So this is um, a timeline of our work, and I'm going to hand over to Misha to just expand a bit upon the first point you see there, which is how this came about for them before they worked with Fulfilling Lives. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, going to try and take you for a quick whistle-stop tour of how this all sort of came about, really. In my sort of... um. Prior to my current role, in the 10 years I've worked for DWP, I've, I've become very familiar with its, you know, its targets, its processes, its internal structure, almost its internal language. Um, but obviously vaguely aware, but not fully sort of, um, uh, sort of looking at the solutions for, in terms of the fact that obviously we're perceived externally, almost sometimes as the enemy, all the way through to sort of things like um, being the benefits police and these sorts of, sorts of things. But it was only in my current role as partnership manager that really my eyes were widened to this because I had that more external face for the organization I think for me the first sort of big revelation sort of day one revelation was you know when I counted all my DW colleagues locally they were dwarfed by the number of stakeholder colleagues that were working with the same people we were working with but also secondarily that we had a really bad perception um, a really bad sort of negative perception of the service that was very toxic in terms of actually sort of having a really negative impact on things like outcomes and engagement and these sorts of things. So there was clearly work to be done locally. So the first thing I did was I set up a sort of a sort of program, sort of coffee mornings, which went over a couple of months. We got about 300 stakeholders and partners to come into Brighton Job Centre to look at the facilities, meet, meet our colleagues, these sorts of things, with the with the sort of intention really that they would come in to the job centre at a busy time of the day through the public entrance, meet our staff, sort of see the building, warts and all, and then sort of give us um, their sort of insight and their feedback at the end of the, of the morning. Uh, 300 people went through this um, this sort of, uh, this these coffee mornings, and we got some incredibly valuable insights that we didn't have before. And most of that insight was really centered on, about 90% of it was centered on our building and our environment in terms of just what a negative impact that has. I don't know if many people know Brighton Job Centre, but it's very sort of, it's very large, it's one of the largest in the country. It's a very square, 70s, brutalistic concrete block sandwiched between sort of arterial road, a police station and, and the magistrate's courts. Um, and the feedback coming back was also about the internal sort of look of the building. It's very sterile, it looks like a statutory service. Uh, it's very foreboding. It's a bit daunting as you come in. There's it's very security conscious and these sorts of things. And all of this was having a very sort of detrimental impact in terms of how people who would never used that service before or were, or were um, um, experiencing trauma would relate to that, that environment. And one person put it very sort of neatly to me at the end of one of the coffee mornings. He said that the environment was speaking louder than our people were. 
And this was this evidence was incredibly valuable and, and incredibly powerful. I was able to take this to the local managers, covering not just Brighton but also sort of wider, which we'll talk about sort of in a bit. And really, that the evidence was um, was so compelling that really they that the idea of a psychologically informed assessment was was really um, you know sort of intuitive and the next step to do. So management were very much won over, but. In speaking to Alan Wallace, who I'd met previously and very fortuitously at the time, I'd just met uh, Alice, Alan Wallace from Burning Lies in Brighton Hove. Um, obviously, the idea of doing a pie assessment was uh, the next logical step. But speaking to Alan, he sort of recounted that really it wouldn't be worth doing. And it was really important that if we did do it, that it had the backing of all of our colleagues. So I went through quite a bit of consultation with our colleagues locally. And broadly, I mean, I'd say 75% of our colleagues, and they are in the hundreds, obviously, locally, were very positive and really backed doing the whole programme of a, of a pie assessment to start with. I'd say about 5% were not positive and quite negative in some cases. I'd say that really, but how I felt that, what that negative was, what that negative was about, was really they were fearful of change but also a bit anxious about how their jobs may change as a result, but also how they lack the confidence in terms of changing and being able to offer a different service, particularly for people that have been in the service for a long time in that sort of place. So, yeah, we, we basically everybody agreed in the end uh, that we wanted to do that pie assessment. I did quite a bit of sort of consultation with those people that were were quite um, uh, reluctant or worried about doing that pie assessment. And I think only in one case in the end did I find one person that really sort of was reluctant to do it because they really felt that a statutory service should sort of be in that sort of sterile environment. And if we had more time, I'd like to, t I would tell you about how actually I won them over in the end, but that maybe that's for another time. Uh, and I'm aware obviously we've got very little time today. So I'll, I'll hand back to Vicky. Thanks, Janisha. I'm sure you'll have lots of people following up with you on that about your secrets of persuading the people who who are a little bit hesitant about making changes. So, um, yeah, as Misha mentioned, he met with Alan from Fulfilling Lives and it was arranged that in 2019 we'd be conducting psychologically informed environment assessments and mystery shopper exercises in the job centre. Um, which I'll describe in a little bit more, more detail on the next slides, but Rebecca's covered as well. And many changes were made as a result of our feedback, including the design and delivery of workshops and training videos for new and current job centre staff in 2020. So psychologically informed environment assessment involves people with lived experience visiting the job centre and feeding back on the physical environment through a trauma informed lens. Some of the changes that arose from our pie assessments with the, uh, the DWP in Brighton were having a clear reception area, clear signs to help customers find their way, reducing the number of security guards at the entrance, artwork and plants on the ground floor, opening the ground floor toilets which had previously been kept locked and people needed to ask to use them, um, and making information stands more visually accessible. Mystery shopping with the DWP involved five volunteers with lived experience visiting the job centre over the course of a week and presenting with complex scenarios which had been pre-agreed with management so that they included a range of elements that could trigger referrals to other services or should do. These people were then debriefed and their feedback was used to assess the service's response to the complexity. These mystery shocks highlighted some gaps in the staff knowledge and confidence when facing complex need scenarios. So it was agreed that Fulfilling Lives would design and deliver a training programme uh, for frontline staff at the DWP. So this is just, just an overview of the workshops that we delivered, which then became training videos because of COVID. Um, we had split into three. We had a client view video, which was um, a workshop, the first workshop or video, which was um, designed and delivered by people with lived experience of complex needs. And it focused on empathizing with the client, um, what could be going on emotionally for the client behind their behaviors, not making assumptions and stigma. 
Then we had a second workshop slash video, which was about the worker, about self-care, about understanding boundaries. And then our third one was about multi-agency working and accepting non-linear um, progress with complex needs clients. So we're gonna move on to talk about the impact key learning and how this could have contributed to a more trauma-informed system. And then we're gonna have a chat with Linda who was one of our volunteers who helped us um, on the lived experience side of delivering this work. Just to start us off, um, we have some quotes here, which are part of the feedback from our training workshops. Um, we train 365 staff in our live workshops, and we've now produced videos, which um, I believe are gonna be on Surrey and Sus Sussex district work coach mm -hmm. training online. Um, we received a net promoter score of excellent on evaluation of those workshops. And uh, we had high percentages of the attendees reporting better knowledge of boundaries within their work coach role improved confidence when supporting customers with complex needs after attending the workshops. And I'm now gonna take the slides down and hand over to Astrid and Misha for their thoughts. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Vicky. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with Filling Lives. It's been really exciting to get involved and we've, had a, we've seen a massive impact across Brighton and then also across Surrey and Sussex with, as Vicky was saying, 38 Brighton staff have been trained um, a lot of them were they working from home in, in um, September 2020. We've also, in the large workshops we ran in May 2021, we had 320 brand new work coaches do the workshops as part of their induction training. And we've had a commitment from our senior leaders that now um, trauma-informed practice and the videos will go into all new staff inductions of all staff across Surrey and Sussex at the moment. Hold this space because we are looking to go bigger, aren't we, Misha? But that's going to be something coming into the future. Um, another, we've also just had the sign off that all of the team leaders, so that's nearly 300 team leaders will also receive a training session in autumn on the uh, Fulfilling Lives videos, and then they can cascade that down to their teams. So that's all about that sort of, you know, looking after people that look after people and getting this staff engagement at a ground roots level. So the team leaders are actively coaching and supporting their staff to use, to understand and to use this trauma informed approach, you know, um, as, a, as a matter of course, really. Um, we have found that there are a lot of other competing priorities within DWP, as it's obviously very data driven, politically driven, and a lot of the things that we have to do um, don't always sit with this approach, with num the numbers game. I don't know if you want to say anything about that as well, Misha, with we've had to sort of work, haven't we, against these time limits we have for appointments, the outcomes that we are supposed to have with customers, which is largely to find employment for people or provisions for training, uh, but also understanding that within universal credit, there are a large proportion of people that are not job ready and the government has a responsibility and we, we have to look after these people and give them equal customer service and access to, to a customer care, um, even if they're dig digitally um, challenged or they have multiple complex needs or whatever. So this is a really, really important part of DWP, although sometimes we get involved in the stats and the the other parts of it. It's it's not to be forgotten. I think you're right. Um, we are in yeah. a, a political we, animal in that's some. That's what we've. That's been our challenge, hasn't it, Lisa, To get this heard when there are so many other competing things, as we come out of lockdown, as we're looking to get everyone back into face to face in the in the job centres, and that's coming down from cabinet level at the moment. So we've got to juggle that with people who have been traumatised, who haven't been out of the house for a long time, who are obviously very often very COVID concerned. And, and asking them to come back into the uh, the brutalist 1970s building and meet with somebody they might not have seen for a year or somebody new. Um, senior leadership have been pretty pretty good, haven't they, Misha? We've we've had some really good buy-in about this. Um, and early indicators are that we're also getting the staff are talking about the training they had in May. People are remembering it. They're they're discussing it, and you know, very very um, positive. Um, so it's all sort of moving forward now. We're looking to sort of get some momentum going on in Misha and to get it get it uh, rolled out further, definitely across here in Sussex and then hopefully across the south of England when we see some good results locally. We were very um, pleased to see yesterday that our mm -hmm. Surrey and Sussex, I mean Sussex sort of senior leadership team agreed to obviously roll out the training that we conducted with all our new work coaches, but 
um, in Surrey and Sussex, but to sort of make this training sort of a focus for team leaders to be able to sort of um, coach and support their teams and try and get more of that sort of consistency of trauma-informed approach amongst their teams so that we have that sort of um, consistent service for people coming in and just constantly trying to drive those reminders that really that we are we're not here to satisfy our processes and our targets that really we need to satisfy the needs of our of our customers within DWP. Can I just mention as well, the Fulfilling Lives videos are absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much for, for making them available to us. And they started off sort of, we started off with a, these three workshops that have you know, crystallized into this fantastic product. And you've taken back the feedback that what we've asked for and we've what we've asked for in DWP. And you've, you know, it's in little five minute bite sized bits that are so digestible and, you know, relevant to everybody. So thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thanks as well. I mean, everybody that's seen the videos produced by Fulfilling Lives that we 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 keep on getting people to see within DWP, um, the feedback has been absolutely astounding. It's been really good. It's been a real eye opener. It's been um, seen by um, particularly sort of groups of our work coaches that are more specialists as well, like disability employment advisors uh, and these sorts of things. So it's really um, been well received. Thank you. Thank you both. And I think that I could definitely feel that throughout the process that we were we had good communication and constant feedback. And it was a very reflective learning as we go dynamic process to get to where we we needed to be at the end. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I'm now going to move on to um, Linda. And uh, Linda was one of our volunteers who took part in producing our training videos. Um, Linda, what was it like um, being part of making a training video that supported the DWP to become more trauma-informed? Well, I, I wanted to attest to Misha's assessment of the reputation that the DWP has <laughs> among the regular people, and it's not good. And, and, you know, sometimes I say, oh, I've been doing this, I've been taking part in this video with the DWP and my friends, my people around me ask, oh, why? And as a joke, I say revenge, but it's, it's not just revenge, it's just, it was a great opportunity to uh, get some agency and have a part in this relationship with the DWP, which is a social service. It's, it's working for us at the end of the day. And it's just, it just feels really good to channel uh, maybe like difficult experiences from the past when I was in a moment of crisis and, and needing the um, service. And yeah, getting to use this difficult experience in a productive conversation that ended up with something that will help, help literally hundreds of people. Uh, so that's really good and gaining confidence and more trust in the system as well in the process because working with really good people who are committed to change, it's always good. Yeah, so really working with, working with the DWP might have increased hope, would you say, for the future and, for, and trust in services in general. Yeah, because even the reaching, the reaching out and the willingness to start this conversation is something that I didn't expect or didn't even think would happen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Linda. And it's voice is something that came up with our other volunteer as well. So um, unfortunately, Sue can't be here today, our other volunteer who took part in this, but she also mentioned that having a voice um, was really important to her in this experience, um, feeling heard and listened to, um, using experiences that might have been a bit negative in the part to contribute to something constructive and building on confidence as well. Um, so yeah, bringing that message from Sue. Um, second question for Linda, why do you think lived experience is so important in developing a more trauma-informed system? Um... Because in gen, I think it was mentioned before, but just the 
everybody knows that when you go through some hard times, you come out a different person. There's a lot of things that you learn, a lot of eye-opening experience, and a lot of insight of on how people <laughs> under duress work or what could happen or how trauma affects you in period of instability. I, I just think that insight and that emotional intelligence is incredibly important to have um, in a workplace in, in general, but especially if it deals with the public at large. Yeah. And thank you for bringing your unique perspective to this piece of work, for helping us to, to deliver it um, and to design it. My final question is to everyone really, which is about um, what might be your final reflections on this or your hopes for the future? Um, I think for me, I think the case was clear for me that obviously we needed to make changes after, after having met Fulfilling Lives and also having that sort of uh, that insight from uh, meeting with partners, stakeholders, basically is the most important thing sort of make that case to decision makers that can then allow an organization to take on these changes and actually lead these changes but that wider need to sort of consult with the consult with the whole workforce on this and the thing that i i keep on being reminded of is the the necessity to take people workers and managers away from their normal routine what their targets are what their diaries are all of this sort of thing and keep on remembering the 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 service users eye and the lived experience eye and try and imagine somebody using their service that has never seen it doesn't understand it has never seen inside the building doesn't know the processes and constantly be reminded of that when obviously our job roles usually suck us into this sort of rabbit hole which can be the processes and the structure of our own organizations and we really need to keep this outward looking approach I think is the most important thing for me that's come out of this uh, partnership and once again it's been such a, a brilliant partnership to be able to do this and without fulfilling lives and without the structure that it's given us and, and particularly the training videos we wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have been able to do some incredible work with particularly a big big uh, amount of new employees in the service that come into the service and are very much um wanting to take on that knowledge so it's been really well timed and, and really productive and constructive Astrid, i don't know I if think, i've said anything I, else I, think in the way. I was just gonna say just for people in dwp to remember it's about people not process all the time and, and sometimes things are intangible cannot cannot be exactly measured you know or, or put on a spreadsheet and and they are just as important to our customers and at the end of the day that is what we're there for is to provide excellent customer service to everybody Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here today. I don't know if you had any final hopes for the future, Linda, or final reflections. Uh, just, I just like to see this, um, all the people working inside the services really taking care to shape the conduct of the service. It's really good to see. Uh, I hope it continues and the yeah. conversations continue. Thank you for your help, Linda.